Good evening. Welcome, everyone, to the Chess Olympiad International Press Conference, Round 6. Uh, we have a mega star cast tonight. The next to me, former world champion, Rustam Kazimjanov. Next to him, Alexei Shirov. And uh, to my left, we have one of the local uh, Norwegian stars, Jan Ludwig Hammer. Welcome. Uh, I guess tonight's big sensation was, Rustam, that you defeated uh, Vladimir Kramnik. Tell a few words, please, about your game. Well, I got very lucky in the opening because um, I think he played a line which I did not expect, but I was very lucky to have analyzed it recently. So I knew some details, and he repeated the game Gelfand Carlsen from some years ago. But they actually noticed that this line is just not very good for black. I mean, the way he played it, queen d6, a lost knight e5, which was missed uh, by Gelfand, Carlsen, and Kramnik, which is probably about the world record, yeah, as far as it goes. And uh, after knight e5, white is just a bit better. And um, after this, everything just worked out for me tactically in this game. This was nice. Well, that's a wonderful accomplishment. And you're doing very well at, at this Olympiad so far in, in the other rounds as well. You defeated uh, Vasily Ivanchuk, among others, and uh, your team is doing great. Yeah, well, unfortunately, today I think we actually managed to, uh, to spoil the match, which looked so promising. But Jumayev was very, I mean, completely winning against Vidla. But now I think it's a draw and we're losing the match. But other than that, yeah, we were doing quite, quite well. Let me go to Alexei. Uh, I'll come back to you afterwards. Uh, Alexei, I walked by your board about um, an hour ago or so, and I saw something uh, very interesting that you would rarely see of a, of a player of your caliber. Two queens, uh, one on c7, another one on d8, Ch checkmating a king on g8. Uh, usually you would see that in scholastic tournaments, yet you were playing, of course, a strong grandmaster from Turkey. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, well, actually, he just decided that uh, to give uh, the game such a nice end, because uh, before that he was trying to make a perpetual check with his queen. I was already rook up, and then he realized that there is no perpetual, so he took my rook and allowed this mate. So, well. The game itself was definitely not like a scholastic game. I think it was a decent <coughs> grandmaster's game, but uh, I cannot say a lot about the opening because uh, I only remembered some of my old game against Levon Aronian from 2005, where I was on black side. So I remembered some ideas from that game, but still, uh, this uh, the variation that happened today on the board didn't enter my preparation for for this game. So. Um, okay, I, I tried to put some practical problems on my opponent, then, and then I saw an inter possibility of interesting peace sacrifice. Uh, I sacrificed the, uh, the knight just for one pawn. Okay, he could, uh, he might not have accepted that sacrifice, and probably it would be round equal. Maybe I'm just a little bit better, but he thought that it was not so dangerous. He thought that he has a piece for just one pawn, and somehow. Uh, I proved that that pawn on d6, which was protected uh, past pawn, was stronger than a piece in this game. So, Of course, okay. I was referring to your game only to the final position, as, as of typically mm. seen in scholastic yeah. position, uh, but, tournaments uh, and not the entire game. Well, I'm definitely satisfied with this game because, okay, since I had to start hard work uh, from the very opening moves, uh, then, okay, of course, maybe we both made some mistakes. I, uh, but still, um, I believe that uh, um, I believe that I knew what I was doing when I was sacrificing a piece, and somehow it worked. So, so I'm quite happy with this game. Although I'm a little bit afraid to look at this with the computer because then, of course, uh, it, uh, it will discourage me a little. <laughs> Alexei, a Latvian chess player, starting with Mikhail Tal, used to be called the magician from Riga yourself, uh, and some other uh, top uh, Latvian players are extremely sharp, uh, entertaining uh, players to watch their games. Uh, you take a lot of risk, a lot of chance. Uh, is there something in the air in Riga, or is it a co coincidence? Oh, mm, hard to say. Of course, uh, of course uh, everything in life is coincidence, and, uh, and every coincidence has certain meaning. So. Um, yeah, somehow maybe maybe people living in Latvia are 
quite romantic in general so and when it comes to chess it's uh, our favorite style it's funny because even our second board Igor Kovalenko who was representing Ukraine before he just moved to our federation uh, well less than two years ago so it's his first Olympic for Latvia but I think uh, his play became a lot sharper after he changed the federation so for example here he won a very sharp game against Nigel Short sacrificing a piece it was almost a positional sacrifice of the piece he had to calculate very deep and very long so yeah so somehow it's uh, um, it's true that we, we see we're still fond of sharp chess in Latvia so maybe it's not a very serious approach but somehow well, it works the chess a fans bit. it's definitely fun to see that and uh, we thank you for that let me go to my uh, left side here uh, you know Ludwig congratulations you won today Thank you. And congratulations to your team, the Norwegian team. Uh, tell a few words, please, about your game today. Um, my game was a very important one. It, it was the game before the match. We had said, this game is our best game. We need Jona Ludwig to win with White. And um, I, I tried as best I could. It was... Did you feel pressure? I, I felt some pressure, yeah. It, it was a very evenly contested match, which is not that common when you have Magnus Carlsen on the first board, but they had uh, Fabiano. And, um, well, basically, I thought before the match we were slight underdogs and, and uh, were very happy to have come out victorious with, uh, with a 3-1 score. How does it feel to play such a mega celebrity like Magnus Carlsen? On the same team. I mean, he's he's so important for the team uh, because he's making it easier for the other players. Uh, number one, by knowing that we can trust our first board. I mean, he's gonna almost never lose a game. He's gonna put pressure on the opponents, and he's making our life easier by giving us sort of taking care of the the other nation's top guy and and giving the rest of us a somewhat easier opposition. How is Magnus as a team player? Well, his most valuable trait as a team player is that he wins so many games and he never loses. And uh, he has shown fantastic plays so far uh, in the Olympiad and we just need, you know, the rest of the team to, to catch up. Is he hanging out with you guys, giving you some tips on how to play or some suggestions? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, we're, we have team, team lunches and team dinners and we... Uh, talk about the games and talk about our preparation and see if there's something we can can learn from from him the norwegian media is going absolutely crazy there i heard there is about 70 hours of live coverage on national television that's unheard of uh, for most chess events and uh, how does it affect you personally and and the team well, um, I think we're getting used to it, uh, which is... Uh, a great thing. A, a very great thing, but also a strange thing, because, I mean, one year from now, um, one, year, um, one year ago, uh, this was unheard of, right? And then the, this NRK, the Norwegian State Broadcaster, uh, showed the, the Chennai match, move by move, and it was such a success. Uh, and, and since then, uh, another TV channel, TV2, uh, has been broadcasting Magnus' tournaments, uh, which is also, I think, very important for Norwegian chess, that it's not only a one-time thing, and also it, it's easier for me, because I'm actually now a, a chess professional, part, partially, because I can make a living of being a commentator, That's an important chess commentator <laughs> uh, on national TV. That's wonderful. Now let me go back uh, to Rustam for a moment. Uh, you have been world champion some years ago and you're representing still uh, Uzbekistan, but you live in Germany as I understand. Where about in Germany? Um, yes, um, actually it's interesting that um, okay, for me there was no question of changing the federation, but I just thought Germany is a good place for a chess player because you're in the middle of Europe get to play a lot, uh, the leagues and the training possibilities. I live um, next to Bonn for many years now, but uh, yeah, I've been representing Uzbekistan ever since I was a little kid, yeah. I know that you not only an extremely successful chess player yourself, but you have been also a very successful coach uh, of uh, Vichy Anand for a number of years. What can you say about uh, the in Indian legend? Uh, how was it working with him? No, he's definitely one of the most talented players ever. I think nobody uh, nobody would contest this. So it's uh, it's always 
interesting and sometimes it's all inspiring yeah? just to see how good he actually is, especially when it comes to spotting some cheap tactics. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's extremely fast. He's yeah. really very, very fast. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I also learned a lot from him. Um, incidentally, um, it's not only him that I worked with. Yeah? For me, working with a German team was also, um, was also creating a lot of uh, fond emotions because this was just unbelievable the way uh, we back then won the European Championship with the German team. I mean, this was really nice. So I did a couple of years, I did more or less full-time coaching. Uh, and um, okay, I mean, I had my, my share of successes, but I still like to play chess myself. Well, that's uh, great to hear. Alexei, uh, you had an adventurous life living in different places. Uh, you represented Spain for a number of years, but several years ago you moved back to Latvia and now you play for Latvia again. How does it uh, feel to be back and again play for your native country? Uh, well, actually, uh, this, uh, I would say these procedures uh, were completely different itself. I mean, I moved back to Riga already a very long time ago, somewhere around uh, the year 2000. So, um, and, uh, but at that time, chess in Latvia was not in the best times. And, okay, for Spain, I was already accustomed to play. So, uh, Spanish Federation wanted me to keep playing for them. So, they... Um, so there was no reason to make any change, but then uh, 11 years later, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm living already more than 10 years in my native country again, and I should give something back to my native country. And then I realized that the only way to give something back to my country would be to start uh, representing uh, my country again. So basically, uh, that was the decision I took uh, in 2011. And, uh, 2012, I was already in Latvian Chess Federation again. It was a very tough decision, I would say. Of course, uh, um, of course, I lost something with that decision, but I think what I gained uh, is much more important because uh, somehow I, I I gained some kind of self-respect that I'm um, I'm with people with the country I was born in. So. Well, certainly a noble cause. Yeah. And finally, i like to ask my guests uh, on the prediction of the final result of both the Open and the Women's Olympiad. Let me start with Ian Ludwig. Who do you think will win the Women's Olympiad first? Um, well, I mean, uh, Russia and China are two very strong contenders, and uh, it's, it's going to be close, but um, the, 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 the smart money is on one of those teams, yeah. So you're not taking a bet on either one, just one of those two? Yeah, if possible, yeah. Okay, how about the open section? Well, the open section is fantastic because there are so many upsets and we see Russia struggling uh, uh, in match after match. I mean, uh, as Khustam was saying, uh, Uzbekistan almost took uh, a match point from Russia this round. So um, I think it's completely open, um, very difficult to predict. Um, I really don't know. Um, it, it's really anybody's game. So um, <laughs> the, the ones who manage to win a couple in, in a row, I mean, no matter if you're ranked uh, 50th, I mean, you're going to be uh, uh, going to have chances to go all the way. How about Norway? Yeah, I, I, w I would very much like that. But we, we need to start performing better against the very best teams. We, we lost uh, against Armenia and um, well, if if we win a couple in a row, uh, anything is possible. But but for now, I, you you look at the ones who are in the lead and manages to to hold on to it, and, and those are the favorites. Well, wish you good luck on your team, Rustam. Yeah, I I mean I'm actually surprised that Russia is struggling a bit because it's such a such a strong team. So I actually expect that now they will kind of start winning some matches. And I would say Russia is still a favorite to win the Olympiad. And as for, as for women, I, I would say China is probably stronger than Russia at the moment, but it's probably going to be decided in just one match. And this one match is always uh, such a difficult thing, but I would say China is probably slight favorite. And most likely we will see that very match the next round, I it's believe. It's possible, yeah. Alexei, what's your prediction? Um, well, we're talking about Russia. We have to mention that Russia is struggling in every Olympiad and normally struggling even quite unsuccessfully. But uh, so, so there is 
no surprise that it's struggling here. But at the same time, okay, they have already won the last European champ team championship, last world team championship, so they're still heavy favorites in my opinion. So something should really, something sh really wrong should happen that they don't win this Olympiad. So. And the women's section? Women's section, to be honest, I don't follow that closely, so I would just... Uh, so, so, in fact, the main uh, information I heard about that was from Rustam Swartz uh, just one minute ago. So, so I myself cannot say anything, I'm afraid. So. Okay, well, thank you so much for all your predictions. And if there are any questions from anybody, otherwise we'll just thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate you joining.